He's a professor at the University of California <coughs> in Los Angeles. So, Zibern, so he was, uh, right. he is a, uh, oh, you have it here. Okay. So, um, so he was, a. Uh, he received the prize, Sakurai Prize for his, uh, uh, com give us the, the, the possibility to compute calculation from the amplitude level. And so he's going to talk about us about these uh, recent uh, projects and the amplitude and gravity. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that nice introduction. Uh, so Lance spoke about uh, amplitudes and QCD. I will talk about amplitudes and gravity. So uh, the, first, the first point will be about uh, complications with gravity perturbation theory. And then uh, we'll talk about the antidotes to the complexity. And Lance already mentioned the unitarity method. So I'll, I'll say a little bit about that. And in fact, the unitarity method, it underpins everything that we're going to be talking about. Uh, even when I'm not talking about it, underneath sits the unitarity method that allows us to do the things that we're going to be doing. Uh, and then uh, I'll talk about this uh, double copy, double copy in the color kinematics duality, which is something that helps us do gravity perturbation theory in a very efficient way. And it's something very cool. I think you'll like it if you haven't seen it before. Uh, and then we'll talk about applications of those ideas. Uh, so I'll say just a little bit about something we call the web of theories. It's a way of thinking about different types of theories and how they're related to each other through this double copy and this color kinematics duality. Uh, and uh, as one application, we'll talk about the non-renormalizability properties of supergravity. And then a uh, very nice application, this is more recent, is to apply these ideas to uh, uh, thinking about gravitational wave physics. And that would be the type of physics for LIGO. So I mean the real thing, not some abstract gravitational wave problem. And then we'll uh, give the outlook. Hmm. So what are the complications? Well, that's kind of simple. It, it's basically that gravity is a mess. That's the complication. And it, it doesn't take long to find the mess. Uh, you, you, can, you can find the mess uh, probably in about a half hour or so. Uh, what you do is you, t you take the uh, Einstein-Hilbert Lagrangian, uh, you take the metric, you expand it around, it could be flat space, it could be around some background, and then you just plug it in there, and then you work out the series expansion in terms of uh, the gravitational field. And what you find in terms of Feynman diagrams, uh, uh, which represent the terms of the Lagrangian, there'd be an infinite set of interactions, three-point interactions, four-point. And these get ever more complicated. And in fact, they get horrendously complicated. We'll have a look at what the three-point looks like in just a minute. And if you compare that to QCD, uh, while QCD is a complicated theory, as, as uh, we heard in, in uh, Lance's talk, it takes some non-trivial ideas to tame it, it's definitely a much simpler theory as compared to gravity. Uh, just from a very simple point of view that these vertices are very simple, uh, 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 relatively speaking, compared to the gravitational ones. So for example, there's just a three-point interaction, a four-point interaction, uh, and uh, the other thing that you can see is that it looks like these theories are quite different. That they don't have much to do with each other uh, other than a superficial connection of some kind, that uh, they have some kind of a uh, gauge invariance, but the details of the theories look quite different. So let's do a little comparison on what these details look like. Uh, so if we look at the uh, three-point interaction, so that would be, uh, say, three gluons interacting or three gravitons interacting. When we do a, a little comparison, we can see that they're uh, quite different. Uh, well, first here, there's a, this thing we call a color factor. And, and that's just the fact that a non-abelian gauge theory has different types of charges, and you need a matrix to keep track of that. So that's this color factor here. And uh, this is based on a Lie algebra. And then there's some kinematic uh, uh, factor, and this is the well-known Yang-Mills interaction. 
And if we compare that to the gravitational one. You can see this one's quite a bit more complicated. In fact, it, it's much more complicated than what, what it looks like is here because there's something hiding in the notation. There's a P6. This represents six terms. There's six different types of terms that you have to permute labels uh, 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 to write down all the different possibilities. If there's three terms, there's a sim here. The sim is a little bit evil because you have to symmetrize on the indices of the graviton on each, on each pair here because the graviton is a symmetric tensor. So you get about 100 terms. And, and uh, pretty, pretty quickly you decide that gravity is a mess. And if you're a, a clever graduate student and your advisor said, I'll go do some calculation using this vertex, uh, you should probably say, oh, that's very nice, but I'm working on something different. Uh, and you can do some very amusing counting. If you just do just some simple arithmetic where you count the number of terms in each vertex, and then you count the number of terms in the propagators, and you just multiply it out, expand it out, the way you would do in a Feynman diagram calculation, you get completely ridiculous numbers. Uh, three loops, you'd be encountering Feynman diagrams with 10 to the 20th terms. Uh, obviously, you can't do such calculations uh, with any computer. And then as you go march down, uh, I'll be talking at some point about some five loop calculation. And you can do a little arithmetic there. You'll get some giant number, 10 to the 31 terms, which happens to be more terms than there are atoms in your brain. And that's a proof you can't do the calculation because it doesn't fit in your head or, or a computer or a disk drive. Um, but, it, but in fact, um, uh, there, we now do these types of calculations routinely, these high loop orders, we do it routinely. I didn't say easily, I said routinely. <laughs> uh, so, but, because you, you have to tame something that's extremely complicated. And also, let's say that if you're doing high loop calculations, uh, it, uh, even in a relatively simple theory like QCD, it's still pretty complicated. Okay, but, uh, but the question is, the idea is to make it doable, that if we have some uh, theoretical question we'd like to answer, then uh, we can answer it. Okay, so how do we tame it? Well, Lance already explained about the uh, unitarity method. Uh, and the basic idea is to think about uh, uh, things from an on-shell viewpoint, where you try to build more complicated objects from... Uh, simpler objects, but, but the simpler objects are in terms of uh, on-shell quantities. That's where Einstein's relation between energy and momentum is satisfied. You do this at tree level. Uh, at Lance mentioned factorization, you do it at loop level. In terms of these cuts, we call them the unitarity cuts. There's generalized unitarity cuts. There's uh, the idea that you put uh, intermediate states on shell in some much more complicated structure, and that way you can reconstruct the entire amplitude. Now, I'm not going to explain exactly how this works or what the rules are, but let me just say there's a systematic set of rules for doing this, and this underlies everything we do. Uh, the basic idea that we should be thinking about on shell quantities and how to, how to construct more complicated amplitudes from simpler amplitudes through an on-shell reconstruction. Okay. And in fact, these little pictures you see here, later on they're going to appear in the gravitational wave problem. Now, I showed you before this extremely complicated gravitational interaction, the three-point interaction. Uh, and the reason why it was so complicated is because we were looking at it the wrong way. We were looking at it in terms of gauge non-invariant quantities, unphysical quantities. The states on the external legs were not restricted to be on shell. They were not physical. So in general relativity, there's a big problem that 8 out of 10 com components of the graviton of the, of the, of the uh, individual states, they're garbage. And that garbage causes a, pen a penalty, a very heavy penalty, that you get a very complicated vertex. We should look at it the on-shell point of view. So let's put these legs on shell, and you discover a miracle. It's in, a, in some sense the key to everything, the tip of an iceberg. 
What you discover is that the gravitational interaction looks like it's a product of yang nose vertices of this kinematic part. So he replaces color factor with another kinematic part. Now, you say, okay, okay, this is pretty cute, but uh, what of it? Because uh, this is only the three-point vertex. Um, and in fact, we're interested, we, need, we would need a method of building the entire S matrix from here. But in fact, we have such a method. Um, well, the first observation that in fact, there is a very simple relationship between gravity and gauge theory, that's from string theory, the Kawhi Long and Kai relations. This is from 1985. Um, it took a while before people appreciated the significance of, of this. Um, and what these relations say is, basically what we found on the previous page is something very general, at least at tree level. It allows, it gives us a, a simple relationship between a four graviton interaction, two gravitons come in, two go out, and we rewrite it in terms of two gluons coming in, two gluons going out, times another copy of it. And that's what this formula says. Uh, if you know what a color ordered amplitude is, well, th these objects are color ordered amplitudes, they're not amplitudes. I mean, that's some manipulation that you do to uh, strip away the color factors. Uh, but in any case, this is, this is something you derive from gauge theory, and it's directly a piece of, of the uh, gauge theory tree level amplitude. And in fact, there's formulas for any number of legs. Kawhi Long and Tai, I think, they did it to six points. Uh, at some point later, we generalized, wrote down the explicit formula for any number of legs. And what you learn from this is something very profound. Uh, the first point is that gravity is derivable from gauge theory. That you do not need to look at the gravitational Lagrangian. The information, everything, can be found in gauge theory. And standard Lagrangians, they offer no hint why this is true. So uh, this Kuala Lumpur, 1985, well, it's uh, quite, quite a number of years later. It's uh, 35 years later. And you can go back to the Lagrangian, and we still don't understand where these formulas come from in a simple way. I mean, sure, you can crank out Feynman rules, and you can prove laboriously these formulas, but there's no intuitive way that you can connect the Lagrangian to these formulas. At least no one knows how to do that. And the other point is generally applicable. So this is derived in string theory, but when you analyze how it works in the field theory limit, then in fact you, you recognize that this, this is a very general formula. And uh, there's more to it. It turns out that if you want to understand the secret of gravity, the place to look is not in gravity, but in gauge theory. We should be looking at the structure of gauge theory, and this would be the first simple example of that. Uh, so uh, here's the three gluon vertex, and these color factors, they obey a Lie algebra, and that's what they do for a living. Uh, Lie algebras obey the Jacobi identity, so that means there's a relationship between color factors of these three types of diagrams, S, T, and U. Now, if, if you use Feynman rules, if you construct the amplitude, there'd be a fourth diagram. But let's use this very fancy identity. Uh, one is equal to S over S, where one over S would be a Feynman propagator. So if the Feynman propagator is missing, you put it back, and you just sort pieces in here according to the color factors of these three diagrams. So you write it, you write the amplitude in this format. There's a kinematic numerator, comes from here and from a four-point interaction. There's a color factor, that's uh, just from sewing up these color factors here. And there's a Feynman propagator. And you can go home and check this. It, it, it works um, no matter how you do it, as long as you put these particles on shell. That's very important. These have to be, this thing has to be, in some sense, a physical quantity. And you will find that the numerators satisfy the same Jacobi identity as the color factors. Now, you'll say, oh, that's very cute. Uh, what of it? No, okay, it's true. This is not uh, so impressive. Uh, but the first point is, it's true in general. 
It's true for an arbitrary number of legs, like we have proven this is a tree level. So let's say five point, you'd write the amplitude in terms of 15 diagrams. And the claim is that there is a way of organizing the amplitude such that for every color Jacobi identity, there's a kinematic identity, one-to-one -one correspondence. Now, if you try this at home with the Feynman diagrams, it will not work. There's a special arrangement. You have to find an arrangement where this is true. Uh, but let's say you can use Feynman diagrams to compute what the correct amplitude is, and then you can, uh, by brute force, you could find an arrangement where this is true, let's say at five points. And in fact, there's general ways of now generating these things for arbitrary numbers of legs. There's a proof of this. Um, and, um, now you still might say, so what? And say, this is very cute, this is very entertaining, but what does this have to do with gravity? Well, it has everything to do with gravity. And the reason is because once you make this arrangement, you've got a magical power. So what we'll do is we'll take an endpoint tree amplitude and we'll rewrite it in this format in terms of uh, 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 where the uh, kinematic numerators of the diagrams, so each term represents a diagram, the kinematic numerators of the diagram satisfy exactly the same Jacobi identity of the color factor. And after that, it's actually quite easy to prove that in fact you get the correct gravity amplitude just by taking the color factor, replacing it by the numerator factor. Now, in, in some way, this is magic because I have to say we do not understand this fully because this implies there's an, some kind of a kinematic Lie algebra behind these numerators. That uh, Lie algebra is only partially understood in certain cases, special cases, so self-dual field configurations, but, but a general, there's no general understanding of that. Um, and and it, this really has some remarkable implications because it states that gravity is not kind of like, like a, a gauge theory. It's really the same physical quantity in the sense that the same dynamic, it's, it's governed, it's, the dynamics of the gravity theory is governed by the same objects, these kinematic numerators, as you find in the, uh, in the gauge theory. They really belong together. It definitely cries out for some kind of a unified description of gravity with gauge theory, presumably along the lines of string theory. Of course, this doesn't prove string theory, but, uh, but clearly these two theories belong together. In detail, the dynamics of the theory, at least as far as these scattering amplitudes are concerned, they're controlled by exactly the same quantities. It's kind of a miracle. And as I emphasize, this is very hard to see from the Einstein-Hilbert-Lagrangian. There's just no way. And, and this is something very general. It works for all sorts of theories. I mean, I'll pick a few easy ones. N equals eight supergravity, if you want that theory. Uh, maximally supersymmetric gravity, what you do is you um, uh, build that out of two N equals four super yang mills theories. You can build N equals five supergravity. From n equals four super Yang mills, n equals one super Yang mills, and so on and so forth. And in fact, now there's a whole zoology of these things. There's so many I can hardly keep track of what's related to what. Uh, so we constructed, there's a little chart we constructed uh, called Web of Theories. So this is in our recent review article. Section five discusses the Web of Theories. So I'm not going to say too much about it, but um, what these lines represent between these theories, uh, let's say there's gauge supergravity, there's uh, uh, like n equals two, Maxwell Einstein supergravity, you know, there, and there's string theories up here, uh, Einstein gravity over here. And, and, and these lines represent that these theories share an underlying theory, like a factor theory. So these, are, these theories are products of simpler theories, like gravity is two copies of gauge theory. Oops, gauge theory. Uh, and what the line represents is that uh, this product theory shares one product. Okay. And if you want to go read about it, and if you go look at that, 
Uh, and the key message from this slide is it's not, it's not just a few theories, it's not just gravity, but it's something much more general that you find in, in uh, theoretical physics of relations between theories and this double copy way of viewing things. Now, I've been talking about uh, this uh, d double copy relation, this color kinematics duality for scattering amplitudes. And an obvious question is, is it possible that the same ideas hold for general classical solutions? You just pick a solution of general relativity, and then you can interpret it in terms of a double copy. Well, we don't know the answer to that in general, but we have plenty of examples. In fact, I, I guess Luna, he will explain some examples. Uh, and there's many examples, uh, like, uh, starting to be a zoology of these. Uh, so there's the black holes, uh, cases with cosmological constants, radiation cases, uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, let me just emphasize, we have plenty of examples, but there's no general understanding. And what we need is some young, smart person to look at the pattern and try to understand uh, how to think about this in a way that's actually very general. So uh, let, let me turn now to uh, the first major application of these ideas. So you say, okay, look, there's this nice relationship between gravity and gauge theory, and the key question is, what are you going to do with it? Okay, so let's talk about one problem. is uh, the non-renormalizability problem in gravity. So Everybody says that gravity is a non-renormalizable theory, that um, it's not like gauge theory. And the arguments are actually pretty straightforward. It's just dimensional analysis. What you do is you notice that Newton's constant is dimensionful. And because Newton's constant is dimensionful, uh, if you were to compare a gravity Feynman diagram to a gauge theory Feynman diagram, you realize that uh, if the gauge theory has, let's say, one power of momentum here, let's say in one, one spot, the gravity one needs two powers of momentum in the vertex. And therefore, when you do the loop integral, this is going to have a poor behavior compared to that one because there's just more powers of momentum up there. And that's the basic argument. Now, you can get very sophisticated and write very complicated papers looking at supersymmetry and superspace and so on and so forth. But this is the essential reason why people say that uh, gravity theories must be non-renormalizable. All point-like theories of gravity must be non-renormalizable. And if you look at Green, Schwartz, and Witten, the various arguments, and that's why we have to do string theory. Well, it might actually be good to know if it's true. In a sense, this is not a question of argument, it's a question of calculation. We know the theories of gravity, we know supergravity, we know how to construct them, and the question is, how do they actually behave? And what you have to worry about is a very obvious loophole. These arguments are based on power counting, assuming there's no hidden symmetry or some hidden structure. And what do I mean by hidden symmetry? I don't mean hidden from the theory. The theory knows very well what its symmetries are. I mean, hidden from us humans, but we haven't thought about it correctly. Because if you've ever looked at the n equals 8 supergravity Lagrangian, you might decide it's actually pretty complicated. Maybe something is hidden. Uh, <clears throat> so it seems like uh, this idea uh, uh, you know, uh, that we can relate this to a simpler theory means we can actually check some of the assertions people have made. And the theory, uh, the best theory to be looking at is n equals 8 supergravity. Uh, the reason why it's a good theory is because supersymmetry helps with ultraviolet problems. Uh, and that's, that's a well-known feature of supersymmetric theories. Uh, so you want to study the theory with the most supersymmetry. That's the most likely one that might actually be finite. Ultraviolet finite uh, might might uh, make it so that these arguments fail. And the other reason is high symmetry means you can go much further in your calculation. So that's a good theory to look at. Well, I construct a little scorecard. 
I mean, there have been a lot of predictions over the years. Uh, over the years, the predictions shift. Uh, people say all sorts of things. So I'm going to make fun of some people, but let me point out that uh, me and Lance, we're, we're up there also. So uh, back in, back in uh, 1998, we wrote a paper where we, we were pretty certain. We, had a, we thought we had a pretty good argument that, in fact, N equals 8 supergravity would diverge at five loops. Uh, and, and over the years, there have been different arguments, uh, and, and it keeps on shifting. And some of the shift has to do when a calculation gets done, then people stop arguing about that, because we now know the answer, and they start arguing about the next level. Uh, so let's have a look at the scorecard. It's actually not so impressive. Uh, you know, pretty much everybody who opens their mouth on this, trying to make a prediction on what, how supergravity actually behaves, where the first ultraviolet divergence is, is generally wrong. Uh, there's one counterexample. Th this counterexample is a little tricky. It has some weird structure. There's some anomaly-like behavior, so it's a little hard to interpret whether this was actually correct or not. Because it's it kind of correct, strictly speaking, but on the other hand, if you look at the details, it's a lot more subtle than uh, than any prediction or, or any the predictions took into account. Um, and the one that we're most interested in, it's this one. Uh, because th this is the place where you run out of uh, supersymmetry arguments. Uh, there's just no way, there's just no, no more supersymmetry. You've used up every drop of supersymmetry to get to this higher loop order. Uh, now, unfortunately, we, we still don't know the answer, uh, uh, very much to, to answer what this is. Um, now, what's the current wisdom? What, what do people say currently? Um, well, the, the uh, symmetry arguments, as far as they've gone, they make various predictions. And in a sense, these predictions, they're, they're actually easy to understand if you're if you're amused, I can explain it afterwards. But essentially, it comes from assuming that there's nothing complicated about uh, the, the maximal supersymmetry or, or the, these extended supersymmetries, n equals 4, n equals 5, and you just count up the anti-commuting parameters and you do some simple power counting, and that's where you get this from. Uh, actually, the actual analysis is much more complicated than that because uh, no such superspace exists, like the, the one I described where you just count up the... Uh, the anti-commuting parameters. It's, it's much more subtle. Uh, but in any case, the, the, <coughs> the current state of the art in terms of making predictions is uh, n equals 4 supergravity should diverge at 3 loops in, in uh, 4 dimensions, n equals 5 at 4 loops in 4 dimensions, uh, at half maximal uh, at 2 loops in d equals 5. Uh, there, here's a weird one. N equals 8 supergravity should diverge at 5 loops and D equals 24 fifths. I mean, what the hell do we mean by D equals 24 fifths? Well, we're theorists. We can do what we like. Uh, uh, of course, uh, we can do what we like, but there's a question, are we doing something sensible? That, that, that's uh, maybe another question. The reason why, uh, why this was done is because the real question we're interested in is not D equals 24 fifths. I mean, let's face it, who cares about that? We're interested in D equals 4. Right? In the real world, in the physical dimension, is there a divergence at seven loops? It happens to be that there's a D8 out of the fourth counter term at seven loops and D equals four, which matches D equals 24 fifths at five loops. So that five, five loops is fewer loops than seven. So that's why we're interested in that. So it, it's just a, a, a stand-in for doing the real, the real problem. Let's look at the scorecard. So we've actually calculated a lot of this. Well, people have run out of symmetry arguments, but we haven't run out of calculation. And the answer is uh, ba basically every prediction is wrong, except for this one. This one we don't know. This is the key one we're interested in. This one, it's a little disappointing. N equals 8 supergravity should diverge in five loops, and it actually does. That means that symmetry arguments are correct. Uh, that nothing has been missed. There's no hidden symmetry in D equals 24 fifths. But the little problem is, how do you interpret this? Let's look at N equals 5 supergravity at four loops uh, in D equals 4. This one 
has an extra cancellation beyond the symmetry argument. How can it be that a theory with less symmetry has more cancellation, extra cancellation, compared to the one uh, with more supersymmetry? It doesn't make sense. Could it be just, well, we shouldn't have worked in D equals 24 fifths, and you get punished for working in unphysical dimensions? Could that be the problem? Well, there's a paper, a recent paper, which in fact emphasizes that. They don't have a proof, but they look at uh, certain pieces, unitarity cuts, and they prove, indeed, there are extra cancellations in D equals 4. So, in fact, we want to go to seven loops. Personally, I'm taking a little break from that. Uh, although Alex Edison, uh, he, he's strong, he's, he's continuing. Um, and, uh, by the way, uh, seven loops, if you know anything about how QCD works, you see that's impossible. But, you know, as we do these calculations, we learn a lot about the structure. So when we began the five loop calculation, seven looked impossible to us. But now that we've done the five, we've learned enough that it actually looks possible. It doesn't mean it's easy. Actually, let me, let me, I'm going to run out of time, so let me just uh, skip this. But there, there's something, I mean, the, the point is there's something mysterious going on. The bottom line is N equals 5 supergravity proves, without any doubt, that there are cancellations beyond the standard symmetry arguments. So there is something going on in these theories, extra cancellations, as we were originally worried about. Okay, and we don't know the answer. Now, there is some, uh, some very positive result from this. From, we could do the D equals 24 fifths, and I say, okay, we got a result we didn't like because there's no extra cancellation. But there is something very positive, which is the very fact we could do this. We can do five loop calculations in supergravity using these ideas I just told you about. Now, I have to admit, it's a little bit more complicated than I made it out to be. There's, there's some issues of exactly how you use this double copy at such a high loop order. Uh, nevertheless, we did it. And so the key message is calculations which are just impossible. I mean, remember that 10 to the 31? And, and if you try doing this, this type of thing, let's say some kind of ordinary superspace way of doing it, you take out the fine minerals of superspace, you're going to face that 10 to the 31. You're not, you can't even touch this. Here, we can do calculations that look impossible, and we do them routinely, even if they're hard, and even if there's various issues you have to face up to. So, this makes us a little arrogant, so we think, ah, gravity problems, we're really good at it. Right? Gravity perturbation theory. So, what's the most interesting gravity perturbation theory you could think of today? There it is. Applications to gravitational wave physics. So, is it possible to apply these ideas I've been talking about to a completely different problem, a problem of classical physics? Well, there's a new era, the era of gravitational wave astronomy. And uh, by the way, I, I started thinking about this uh, uh, pretty early. It, it's a little fact that uh, for an instant, this, first, that this is the first event, it was brighter in gravitational radiation than all the stars in the visible universe are in electromagnetic radiation. And that's really awesome. I mean, that, that's what, a lot of power coming out of this thing. Okay, so the, but the question is, okay, we're particle theorists. We don't do general relativity. How can we help? So you can look at uh, the typical problem we're interested in. So Lance spoke a lot about this. Uh, there's a collision, and then out comes uh, particles uh, in an unbounded trajectory the types of things we think about are gauge theories, QCD, electroweak. We think about quantum field theory. We're doing this in the quantum realm. On the other hand, the problem of gravitational radiation as seen by LIGO uh, is uh, a different problem. That's a bounded orbit. That's general relativity, classical physics. There's a black hole there. And you say, what the heck do these two things have to do with each other? Uh, it, it turns out a lot. 
And it's just based on some simple insight that uh, the black holes and neutron stars, we can think of them as point particles as far as long wavelength radiation is concerned. And once we can think of these things as point particles, that's our territory. And in fact, this was known long ago. Iwasaki understood this back in 1971, that you can think about uh, this problem from the point of view of a perturbation theory of Feynman diagrams, you think of Feynman diagrams. Goldberger and Rothstein systematized this, this way of thinking about it, and many people have been thinking about it. But uh, what I want to uh, tell you about is that, in fact, these ideas that I've been telling you about, they're, in fact, ideally suited for pushing state-of-the-art in this type of problem. Okay. Now, <coughs> there, there's, we have, you know, I have to explain a few things. Uh, there's some issues here. The, the, this, is, this is a quantum problem. This is a classical problem. So how to think about how to go between classical and quantum, how to go between unbounded and bounded. Those are, in a sense, the key issues that we have to face up to if we're going to use any of the technology and any of the ways of thinking about things. So, so first, uh, let me explain what, what we want to uh, uh, try to solve or help with. Um, so the, the problem um, is two black holes, there's an in-spiral, and they decay because they emit gravitational radiation, and then at some point there's a merger, and then the ring down. So the ring down, that's done by a perturbation theory of quasi-normal modes of the vibration. Never mind that, that's under good control. The merger, well, that's not for us. That's done by numerical relativity. You can't do that by perturbation theory because uh, at, at this point, everything is strongly interacting. The part that we want to look at is the in-spiral phase, and this is done analytically. So the professionals do not do this numerically. They do it analytically. They use numerical relativity to help guide models, to, to build very accurate models, but this is done analytically using perturbation theory as the basic building block. It's called uh, post-Newtonian theory. Okay, and this is up our alley, because now we can think of these as two-point particles, and then there's uh, a perturbation theory to try to understand the corrections that come from general relativity. So what's this post-Newtonian approximation? So this is, the, say, the standard way of thinking about this problem. Uh, so what you do is you expand in Newton's constant and v square, and that's very reasonable because uh, by the virial theorem, v square is like gm over r, so there's a balance between kinetic energy and, and potential energy, and they're the same order of magnitude, so do a simultaneous expansion. And, uh, and Einstein understood this. Einstein, Infeld, and Hoffman, they worked out the first post Newtonian correction to the Hamiltonian. Uh, so this first term here, this thing you can recognize, that's Newton. And then here's the first correction. And then over the years, people have been systematically grinding these out. Uh, this was done in 2017, this is 2019, to get the fourth post-Newtonian order. And the reason people do this is because it's important. This, these terms can be measured by LIGO. And more importantly, they're used for constraining these what they're called uh, models, like effective one-body model, constraining the models that are used for the actual waveform construction. Uh, you, need, you need to go, you have to have some information beyond perturbation theory if you want to get very close to the merger, I, I, which in fact you can see uh, the blue is where you're using uh, an improved perturbation theory, but the input is still perturbation theory. And of course, the people in scattering amplitudes, you know, we realize that something could be done. So there's a bit of an industry that's developed, a small industry on, on these questions. Uh, the one basic question which a lot of people have worked on is the connection to scattering amplitudes. Uh, how is this problem connected to scattering amplitudes? What's a good formalism going from the problem of scattering amplitudes to the problem of, of uh, let's say, a two-body potential trying to work out the Hamiltonian of, of the um, 
of the two in spiraling black holes. Uh, there's world line approaches people have taken, uh, looking at double copy. There's various technical issues having to do with how the double copy works, and it gives too many states, and you have to get rid of some of the states. How do you do that? But uh, really, there's, a, there's a, a fundamental question, more important than any other question. Can we do something beyond the state of the art of the general relativity people? Because if you can't, it's just fun and games, and you're, you're just chasing them. You can't, right? You know, you, you, you want to make a difference. You want to do something beyond the ability of our general relativity friends. So when we started thinking about this problem, uh, we had, in a sense, uh, some boundary conditions of what we wanted to do. So there's various things you can look at. Uh, you can look at spin effects, and a lot of people work on spin effects. This is very popular. Finite size effects, that's, in the, that's important for neutron stars. Uh, new physics effects, radiation, high orders of perturbation theory. So the question is, which problem should we look at? And remember, we want to make a difference. So first thing, absolutely, it has to be extremely difficult by standard methods. It's not extremely difficult by standard methods, and what do they need us for? It needs to be of <coughs> direct importance to LIGO theorists. It needed to be relevant for the core mission of LIGO, and it needed to be in a form, at least in principle, to enter the LIGO analysis pipeline. If you give them some object that they can't use, that's not so helpful. So what's the answer to that? Well, it was a unique choice. Uh, of course, we spoke to our friends in the general relativity community to figure out what's really the best thing. High orders of perturbation theory, and the precise name is the two-body two Hamiltonian at the third post minkowski in order. Okay, what is that? Well, that was laid out very nicely by Alessandra Bunano. She came to Amplitudes 2018 and she told us what to do. What's the important thing to do? So, this is a bit of a crowded uh, slide, but I, I like it because it comes from authority. Uh, and, and this lays out the different types of perturbation theory. Uh, so, we can do a perturbation theory post Newtonian. And that's by following these columns here. So you're expanding in velocity, one of our actually means g, and you're expanding in Newton's constant. And this would be Newton, this would be Einstein, uh, Infeld, and Hoffman, and so on and so forth, um, just marching down here. But there's another perturbation theory that is much, much more natural from the point of view of particle physics, and that's you just do what we call perturbation theory. You expand in Newton's constant, in the coupling constant, uh, and you do not expand in velocity. From our point of view, it's a silly thing to do because uh, it, we want to do things in a relativi relativistically invariant way, Lorentz invariant, so you want to keep all orders in velocity. Uh, and in fact, this has become much more popular. In, even independent of us, the general relativity community realized that... Uh, hmm, he reads my mind. Uh, the general relativity community uh, realized that this is a, a, a much better way of organizing the perturbation theory in terms of understanding its analytic structure. And then Alessandra, she said, look, this hasn't been done, this is what you need to go do. So let me clear, be clear about what we're after. So <clears throat> what we want to do is replace general relativity with something a little bit different. Uh, it's, it's a two-body interaction, a potential, very much like Newton's potential, but extra turns, uh, such that we extract all the physics juice from uh, general relativity, leaving behind uh, the, the complexity, but we have the physics. Uh, and the part we're after is the conservative part, the Hamilton, the, it's the Hamiltonian, and the radiation part, that gets treated separately. If you're interested in how that's done, I can explain that afterwards. Uh, <coughs> and uh, we want to do it in a way that's compatible with special relativity. It needs to be valid to all orders, uh, sorry, uh, order, to valid to order G cubed, the next order. How do we do it? Well, this is laid out very nicely in a paper by Chung, Rothstein, and Salon. We take ideas from effective field theory. We put it together with ideas 
from scattering amplitudes, and that gives us these post minkowski potentials. Now, when, we start, when I started looking at this pro problem, uh, it's actually kind of amusing, uh, because um, you realize, uh, or at least I realized very quickly, that what I learned in graduate school wasn't quite right. Uh, so, uh, at tree level, it's pretty simple. If you want a potential from an amplitude, you just take a Fourier transform, and pretty much that's all there is to it. But if you go beyond one loop, things, uh, things become very unobvious very quickly. Uh, the first a little surprise is, uh, at least what I learned in graduate school, is every loop is an h-bar. Uh, that means loops are, are quantum and should be ignored. They have nothing to do with classical physics. That, that's completely wrong. Uh, while it's true if you scale h-bars in a certain way that it's a true statement, uh, the, the pertinent question is, how do you extract classical physics from here? And, and if you do the scaling correctly, in fact, the loops scale like one over h bar, backwards. Uh, and I say, where did that come from? That, that's not so complicated. If you take e to the i s classical over h bar, you series expand, you get one over h bars. And that's related to iteration, double counting. But in here, what you get the, the uh, tree amplitude comes three times and there's an iteration and you have to take that out because you're not interested in the pieces you've re you already understand, like the tree pieces. Um, but you can get confused very quickly because you start worrying about cross terms between 1 over h bar and h bar and what's quantum, what's classical. And the right way to deal with this problem, at least the cleanest way of dealing with this problem, is to use effective field theory. And the effective field theory, what it does for you for a living, is it defines the potential. We're interested in classical potential, but we have scattering amplitudes. How the heck are you supposed to extract a, cl a p classical potential from some quantum scattering amplitude? This is the solution. You write down an effective field theory for black holes that are interacting. I can call them scalars, or I can call them black holes. So, uh, so A and B are two different black holes. So, um, and this would be the kinetic term. It's relativistic. You'll say, but wait a second, this doesn't look like what you're used to, the quadratic one. But remember, the quadratic one has antiparticles. We want classical field theory, classical physics, so no antiparticles. So that's the kinetic term. But the uh, interaction is just the interaction potential. So this is the potential. So at the lowest order, Newton sits here. At the next order, there would be Einstein, Infeld, and Hoffman would be inside here. And this just represents two black holes interacting. A is, is one black hole, there's another one, there's the potential. Okay. And the way we extract the potential is by matching to the full theory. We, we demand this theory give the same scattering amplitude. So we do two simultaneous calculations uh, in parallel. Full theory, we take out the heavy machinery. We have amplitude method, double copy, unitarity method, we do this all in the context of h bar goes to zero, and, and there's some loop integration you have to do, you get an amplitude. And the effective field theory, that's a much simpler theory. We just use Feynman diagrams. And you just uh, make an ansatz for what the potential is. You feed that ansatz to the end. You demand these two be equal. That determines what the coefficients in the ansatz is. And now you have your potential. And, and then you're done because you can now hand that potential or hand the Hamiltonian associated with that potential. You can hand it to your uh, LIGO theory friends and they're absolutely delighted. <coughs> I mean, just to show you, uh, I think I'm running out of time. Okay, yeah, I'm definitely running out of time. So, uh, a little bit of what goes into this. We have, uh, we use unitarity and double copy. So, the first interesting thing that happens is we're interested in the long-range forces. So, uh, we're interested where the gravitons are long-range and that effectively what it does is it puts the gravitons on shell. So there's one black hole, another black hole interacting through gravitons. These are on shell. So we're, we're in unitarity heaven because the problem itself puts things on shell. And then it turns out that if you want the classical limit, in fact, one more matter line has to go on shell. And, and, and that's related to the fact that the energy integral should be localized because of classical physics. Uh, you, you know, Einstein's relation between energy and momentum has to be satisfied. So, in fact, one more line goes on, Shelton. Now you're really in heaven. 
So to build up the, the, the scattering amplitude, you just have to do uh, uh, these unitarity cuts. Take a 3.3, 3.3, 4.3, multiply, sum over the states, and you have it. And to the next order, this is the one we were after, the new one, then it's just a handful of these three unitarity cuts. The worst thing is the five-point amplitude. We're in heaven. So just to show you uh, one example here is, uh, let's say, one loop. Then um, the way you do this is you take a 3.3, 3.3, gravity, 4.3, multiply them, sum over states, use the KLT relations. That would be one way to do it. BCJ is used for, uh, for uh, other reasons, for technical reasons having to do with infrared singularities. That's a better way of doing it or a more rigorous way, but, but this is a clean way of doing it, maybe less rigorous. Um, but, but in any case, uh, you use the KLT relations and, and life is good. And to show you how simple this is, these are the four-point amplitudes in helicity states, and they are really simple. And, and uh, you can do a little spinnerology, work out the cuts, you get uh, you know, some simple expression in terms of kinematic invariance. You see there's these pieces like something squared. So if you wanted to now do the gravity case, you take two copies, like two pieces of paper, and merge them, and you get now the gravity answer. You see there's the fourth power, Previous one was two powers, so that's double copy at work. Uh, and then uh, it's straightforward then to extract, you know, do the matching, get the potential, get scattering angles, do classical physics. This one is more complicated, of course. Um, it's a two-loop problem. Uh, but the ideas are the same. It's, it's just like a one-loop, except you just have to do uh, more, more algebra. There's some uh, non-trivial trickery of exactly how to do these integrals. These are two-loop integrals, so you have to do them right, and you have to do them in a way that makes use of the fact that you're only interested in the classical part to do them efficiently. And long story short, there's the answer. It might look complicated to you, but I'll show you in a second. This is actually incredibly simple, this answer. Uh, and it's in terms of uh, various kinematic invariants, um, and you go through the matching, you, the effective field theory, extract the potential. Here's the potential. Newton is hiding right in here. Uh, this looks more complicated than Newton because, remember, Newton is static. This now has velocity terms. So this is like Newton plus velocity terms. The first term here, that's a Newton-like thing. And here's all the velocity corrections to Newton. Einstein, Infeld, and Hoffman is a combination of these two pieces, some of this and some of that. Uh, and the key thing, this is all orders in velocity. Now you might say, okay, this is very nice. How do you know it's right? Well, the answer, of course, is we have to compare to the literature. There's a vast literature in the post-Newtonian approximation done all the way to fourth post-Newtonian order. So we can series expand in velocity and turn it turn our expression into a post-Newtonian type expression where you series expand in velocity. And then what you do is you just have to grind out a canonical transformation to match their result. Because their Hamiltonian will not match ours because two Hamiltonians will never match if done by two different people because in general there will be some canonical transformation between them. And uh, actually one new test that just uh, came out, Bini and Damour, they verified that, in fact, to the next order, beyond where we looked, that, in fact, we also have it correct. And uh, just to amuse you, this is what the fourth post-Newtonian post Hamiltonian looks like. It looks like a mess. Uh, why is it a mess? Well, one reason is they series expand a simple function, so they turn it into a mess. Uh, so, you know, don't series expand it. And the other reason is they have a poor gauge choice as far as getting a clean answer. Uh, it's actually uh, ADM Hamiltonian, if you, if you care what it is, but that is not a good choice if you're interested in clean answers. Uh, and then, okay, our, our, our LIGO theory, theory friends, are they interested in it? Absolutely. It only took them eight days to write a paper. <laughs> uh, to, to, just, to try to understand that as a first pass, does this actually help with LIGO? 
Uh, uh, there, there's no conclusion on that point from this paper, and I have no idea how it will turn out once it's done more carefully, but at least this is a demonstration that our friends are definitely interested in, the, in, in this, uh, are excited about this, I should say. Anyway, they say, encouraging more study. Sounds good to me. Most exciting part of this is that the methods are far from exhausted. Uh, I'm almost done. Um, and we're starting to work on the next order, and in fact, the path looks clean. Uh, the main thing we have to do is, I have to do is clear my desk of other things so we can work on this. But uh, the, the, the methods uh, were cert most certainly not exhausted. Uh, but probably something even more interesting is, uh, in the first pass that we set up this problem, we were thinking about it from a certain viewpoint of how to do it, and that had to do with matching available technology, uh, which is not necessarily the most efficient way to do it. So I am quite sure there will be much, much better ways of doing it in the coming years. But when we look back five years from now at how we did it, you know, we're all going to laugh, look at these clumsy guys, how they did it. There's definitely better ways of doing it. And there's uh, clearly uh, other things to be looking at besides just the conservative Hamiltonian that we were looking at. Uh, uh, there's, uh, well, straightforward things would be higher orders, of course, so that's looking at the Hamiltonian. Uh, resummation, that's the key. Why are we doing perturbation theory like this? I, part of it is because we think, well, if we do one more order, it'll feed into some improvement eventually into LIGO or future experiments. But but we're really, in a sense, after the big, the big things, trying to understand not just each order of perturbation theory, but to try to understand the full structure and try to do at least some partial resummation. In order to do that, you need clean perturbation theory. Uh, that's a strong motivation for this post-Minkowski approach. You get a much cleaner uh, perturbation theory compared to post-Newtonian. Uh, there's uh, radiation spin. This is a very hot topic. Everybody's working on this including us, which is stopping us from working on that. But, <laughs> but anyway, uh, finite size effects um, uh, would be another thing. And we should expect many more advances. So the summary is particle physics uh, gives us a new way to think about problems of current interest in general relativity. Uh, this double copy idea gives us a unified framework for gravity and gauge theory. I showed you some applications. There's this web of theories, which I didn't speak about very much, but you can look at our review article. Uh, we have a giant section on this web of theories. Uh, so it, it describes different relations between theories that look like they're not related to each other. High order, calculate, uh, high order explorations of supergravity, especially in the ultraviolet. That's something I explained in a little bit of detail. This two-body Hamiltonian for gravitational radiation, what I spent uh, quite a bit of time on. And, and that looks really promising also for the future for what can be done. Uh, so the final summary is we can expect many more advances in the coming years, not only for gravitational wave physics, but more generally for understanding gravity and its relations to the other forces through the double copy. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. So we have time for questions. Yes. Okay. You have that. Excuse me. What is the difference between gravity and supergravity? And where applies one and where applies the other? Okay, sorry. I did not hear your question. Yeah. What is the difference between gravity and supergravity? Right. And what apply the first, and what applies the other? Was it gravity and supergravity? Uh, so from our point of view, let me go back here. So from our point of view, a supergravity is not different from gravity. It's just a theory of gravity with some matter thrown in. It's thrown in in some special way so that you get extra cancellations and extra symmetry. But as far as like the logic of how you attack the problem, how you think about the problem, there's no difference. Uh, gravity itself generally is more complicated than supergravity, simply because these extra states uh, cause cancellations of complicated pieces. 
Any other more questions? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, that when that you can use potentials and expand. Well, you can expand. You're trying to expand general relativity in potentials and several other other terms. And also, you mentioned the effective field methods. But are these methods useful for exploring high energy things about gravity, like singularities in black holes, or there was this break at the ultraviolet behavior? Well, I, I'm a little unsure how to answer this. So each, for, every problem, for every problem you're interested uh, in, in physics, uh, roughly speaking, there's an effective field theory, an appropriate effective field theory for studying that problem. This, effective, this particular effective the field theory is specifically designed, whoops, I can't do this. Well, oh yeah, <laughs> there's a black hole, there's another one. It, it's specifically designed for this problem of figuring out the, the conservative potential between two black holes. If you're interested in another problem, you'd probably want to design some very different effective field theory. Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, I was really interested especially to see how you can calculate this enormous number of, of diagrams that come, would naively appear to come from the perturbative expansion. But my question is related to that because although I agree that there may be say 10 to the 31 diagrams that you... No, I didn't say 10 to the 1 diagram, I said 10 to the 31 terms in one diagram. Okay, so 10 to the 31 terms in one diagram. Are you calculating all of those terms with this technique, or are you calculating only the UV divergence? Um, so we, we, construct, we construct all the... So well, first, we don't, at five loops, we do it in N equals H supergravity. So that immediately causes an enor enormous, uh, uh, cancellation, um, enormous cancellation. The integrand that we construct is for everything. It's the entire integrand. Uh, of course, there are not 10 to the 30th terms in that thing because that thing has been highly cleaned. Uh, the basic trickery that makes it clean is you use the cleanliness of N equals 4 super Yang mills to then import that cleanliness so that you get reasonable expressions in, uh, for the integrand of N equals 8 supergravity. Then when we integrate this thing, then we only integrate it for the ultraviolet divergent terms. Uh, but at least we get past the problem that if you uh, want to inspect whether a term is ultraviolet divergent and you have 10 to the 31, you'd have a lot of trouble going through those terms. Here, you just sweep over the terms and you pick out the ones that contribute, and then you, uh, you basically do a series expansion in the ultraviolet and work out the integrals. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. So, uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, in the potential, uh, the higher orders uh, started looking simpler and simpler. Uh, is that uh, right, and um, why? Simpler, uh, no, the higher, well, uh, I, in some way they're getting relatively simpler, in a sense compared to what you might have expected. But, the, oh, wait, funny. so the first term, I mean, the first term is pretty simple. Uh, the third term, so this is the term we worked out. It has a, a new type of structure. There's a log. This arc cinch is really a logarithm. Um, so you could say maybe that's more complicated. Um, so I wouldn't say it's getting simpler and simpler. I'm saying that, I guess what I'm saying is I can fit this thing on a page, and I'm even better, I can fit this thing in my head, and I can start thinking about the general structure of this thing. I, I was uh, looking, I think, uh, two slides after this one. Uh, Oh. Oh, so. Oh, they, oh, no, no, no. Ha ha ha. <laughs> no, no, no. They they dropped it. This is post-Newtonian. So, the reason why uh, it looks um, simpler is because they dropped the mess. Uh, so, uh, if they go to the next, so if they go to the a fifth post-Newtonian and they start picking up terms like e to the fourth plus velocity then it gets much more complicated. So, uh, so it, de it definitely does not 
get uh, simpler as you go on. Uh, the reason why I pointed this out is because we are not sensitive to those terms. We're sensitive to everything else. It's just I was too, yeah, I was running out of time, so I, I didn't explain how we lost these terms. So uh, when the comparison is done, there's an overlap. So they have some pieces that we don't have, because it's high order in G. Uh, and we have pieces they don't have, because we have all orders in velocity. But the overlap part is the, uh, we, we agree perfectly on. And that's, you could say, the most complicated of what they have. Yeah, actually, that's a good cat. It looks a little weird. How could it be that higher order stuff? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we have the last question there because otherwise we're going to finish very, very late. So, please. Oh. Sorry. Uh, thank you very much for this nice talk. Professor, do you know if, if uh, having this nice relation uh, about um, young Mills and gravity and the perturbative level are, are apply also in the non-perturbative regime? Or well, no? luckily our next speaker can say something about that. Okay. So he will be looking at classical solutions of, uh, I, I guess it's the black hole ones that he'll be looking at. Okay. Um, so anyway, we should just wait for the next talk and you'll have at least a partial answer. So I think the answer is to stay tuned. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We thank uh, Zvi Bernakin. Thank you.